You're now listening to the Tax Smart REI podcast, the number one tax podcast for real estate investors. Hey, thanks for tuning into this week's episode of the Tax Smart REI podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about the triple tax benefits of paying your children to work in your business. And not only are there tax benefits, but you also get to teach your kids the value of hard work. We'll be diving into all of that in just one minute. Hey, are you an investor looking to slash your tax bill? Then get ready to discover everything you need to know about the short-term rental loophole to save up to five to six figures in taxes with our comprehensive STR task course. Valued at $247 is now just $1 for a limited time when you sign up for our Tax Smart Insiders community. Here's what you'll get when you sign up. Learn tested methods that have helped thousands of investors maximize their tax savings, get expert guidance and support from our team of real estate CPAs, and enjoy unlimited access to the course materials. Don't miss out on this incredible limited time offer. Visit www.taxsmartinvestors.com slash free STR course to enroll today. Again, that's www.taxmartinvestors.com slash free STR course to enroll today. We'll see you there, but for now, we'll dive right into today's episode. All right, and we're back. So we get this question all the time, how investors can pay their children to work in their business, not only, again, not only for the tax benefits, but also to teach their children the benefits or the lessons of hard work. So Ryan, I know this is one of your favorite strategies. We were talking about it before the show. Uh, why is it one of your favorite strategies? And then we'll dive into the the brass tax things. Yeah. So a brief comment just on the tax side. On my perspective, if you implement it correctly, and especially if you can start your kids at a young age, we'll get into that too in, in a minute. This to me is essentially as efficient as an HSA because dollars can go in tax efficient, can grow tax efficient, and then potentially come out tax efficient. So essentially like paying no tax at, at any step, depending on how it goes in, grows and whatnot. So essentially just as efficient as an HSA. And I'd say an HSA is again, one of the easiest, not necessarily high dollar amounts and ne not necessarily is this either, but really tax efficient. And again, we'll break that down as we go. But the second part you already mentioned, Tom, which is the essentially the intangible piece of not only just the dollars, kind of the tangible is what I'd say there, but the intangible of things like getting your kids work experience. So now they're essentially starting to build a resume. Number two, they're getting experience doing that. They are learning different skills uh, depending on what you put them through. And they're just getting ready to like, I kind of leave the home <laughs> essentially right. be more successful in independence and, and happy in, you know, going into the workforce. So you're setting them up well, tangibly, again, talk about dollars here in a little bit, but also just the intangible of kind of helping them to build skills and be ready to go just outside of the dollars. So as a lot of people talk to us, clients or prospective clients, a lot of people are thinking about generational wealth. This is one of those key ways to do this and to get your kids started at a young age so that they don't become, you know, trust fund kids uh, <laughs> to get them started early on and actually working. This is one way to do it. Get them started working young and actually earning dollars so they can understand money too. That's another big aspect of the intangibles, uh, having them understand how money works and investing or giving or spending all the various components of actually how money works too. So, so much to unpack here. And as someone who has a two-year-old on the way and a growing family, like this is on my mind. I've got many years until I can actually implement I'm just waiting for the day that uh, my son is nine years old. We'll get to why nine in a little bit. Uh, but at the end of the day, very excited to talk more about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's just jump in with the basics here. So what are the tax benefits for your children? And what are some of the foundational rules here? I'll cover that. And then we'll get into some of the tax benefits for the parents. All right. So uh, first things first, the Fair Labor Standards Act or the FLSA allows children under the age of 18 to work for their parents' business. Now there is no, actually there's like, it's relatively loose, right? There's no time limits, right? If your child is able to work for you, they can work for you for unlimited hours, at least according to these laws. So there's no cap on the amount of hours per se that they can work. So that's kind of just the first thing to kind of be aware of. Now you can pay them up to the standard deduction, which is currently $14,600 in 2024. And your children will a receive the money tax free. So they can receive up to $14,600 tax free. And they generally do not have to actually file a tax return assuming this is their only income. If you have other income, if they're subject to the kitty tax, there might be other things and other reasons why they might have to file a tax return. We're not going to go into that today, but assuming that's their only source of income is what you're paying them through your business. If they're under the age of 18 and you file a W-2 and it, you can actually do that relatively streamlined. We might get into that a little later, but you could pay them again, $14,600 
and they will not have to pay taxes on it. However, it's important to note, though, that you do have to pay them a reasonable wage and they have to perform legitimate services within your business. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. But you can't just pay them $200 an hour to clean your office or to clean up a spreadsheet or mail letters or whatever the case may be. It has to be legitimate services and reasonable wages. Yeah, I have a lot of comments to add here. <laughs> Uh, because I've heard people, you know, do the kind of good, the bad, the ugly sort of thing. So the good things that you said, right, reasonable wage and a couple comments there that uh, I don't know if we were going to talk about later, but just reasonable wage probably for a nine-year-old is going to be minimum wage, right? Like depending on exactly what they're doing, it's probably going to be minimum. And a lot of people then ask, well, what's minimum wage for me? It's going to depend on kind of where you are, your county, your state, things like that. So it's, it's kind of a Google search in looking that up. But the other thing I just always like to comment too is it's generally going to be by the hour, especially again for a nine-year-old, a 10-year-old, even a 17-year-old. Their work schedule is probably going to be like mostly in either evenings or weekends, right? Just thinking school year. Or if it's in the summertime, it's going to be a lot, right? If they're not in like summer camps or extracurriculars or sports or hanging out with friends over the summer, like their time is going to be like extremely high in the summer and probably the rest of the year is going to be very minimal, if any. So just the whole idea to me of like a salary for kids doesn't make sense because it's going to be very sporadic in kind of how they help and when and, and so forth. So those are two things, by the hour and minimum wage, if you're kind of thinking the dollars. The second thing too that you said, I just wanted to highlight is it actually has to be work. <laughs> like you can't just be like, oh, I'm going to pay my kids, like we said, 200 bucks an hour, or 200 bucks a week or a month, whatever. Like they got to actually be doing something. And one thing in there that has always been a little bit of like, eh, is the whole idea of like the modeling services for like someone who's like one, two, three years old. It's like, oh, I took a picture of them for my marketing material. It's like, okay, how much are you paying them? How did you come to that? How many hours, right? And, and so forth. You can't be like, oh, I took one picture of my, say, son. I put them up on my wall in my office and therefore that's $15,000 I'm going to pay them. Okay. That's a little ridiculous. <laughs> like that doesn't make any sense. They're not actually performing services and no one would do that. So those are a couple of comments I have there. But yeah, the FLSA, the whole thing about that as well. And the ownership of the company needs to be exclusively owned by the parents. So sometimes one trip up there is you might be in a partnership with a friend or another family member that could cause an issue here with the FLSA. The business has to be owned hundred percent by the parents. There's a whole lot more that's running through my head. I'll just pause because I'm sure you got comments too, Tom, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. But before we dive into the tax benefits for the parents, which there are certainly benefits there too. I know you mentioned a few times, nine years old, and I know there's tax court cases out there that kind of back up the ages for legitimate work. Why is it nine years old or what, why is there like an age, you know, could you, could you go into that a little bit? Yeah. So there was kind of a court case that we've reviewed. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but that we've kind of come back to a couple of times. Essentially there was, I think three kids, two of the kids, I think the age was 11 and 13. Don't quote me on that. I think it was 11 and 13. And then there was one child that was seven. They all were basically paid a wage. But essentially, the court said that the seven-year-old was not old enough to perform meaningful services for the company. So again, that goes back to like work actually has to be done. And they essentially said like the seven-year-old couldn't really do that. They were too young to, in the eyes of the court, really perform meaningful work for that business. But they were okay with the 11-year-old. So if seven's not good, 11's okay. Well, maybe nine is good. Maybe nine is kind of the, the minimum, right? And there's only so many things that we can evaluate really in the FLSA document. It really just says parents don't have, you know, an issue if the kids are, there's no age limit in the FLSA. So they leave it really vague. And so then it gets tested in courts like this one. And all we can see is 11 was fine. Seven wasn't. So maybe nine is kind of the minimum. But again, it's going to depend on the kid and what they're doing, maybe their maturity, kind of the work that they're actually involved in that might say, okay, maybe an 80-year-old is okay, eight's fine, but we're just a little bit more comfortable saying nine because we've seen yes and no. Okay, let's take the middle. That should be okay. Yeah, absolutely. And that court case was Eller versus Commissioner. And in the details that you referenced, we're, we're on point there. So it's just something to keep in mind. You know, you wouldn't want to pay your five-year-old, you know, again, $200 an hour to clean your office, 
for the most part, it will be minimum wage, as Ryan mentioned before. And you could find out what the minimum wage is for your state and your locality by doing a Google search or checking with your local chamber of commerce. I'm sure they would have it, although Google probably definitely has it. So just something to keep in mind there. Don't go wild. Don't go crazy. They do have to have a job description. Okay. So you do need to have a job description of what they're performing. And you really need to hire them like any other hire that you would do for your business and a lot of those steps. Now, one thing I'll talk about here on the compliance end before we move on to the parents, I know everybody's probably waiting for that part, the tax benefits of the parents. But another thing is you do have to, if you, if you are using an S corporation, for example, they will be subject to self-employment tax still. So if it's a partnership or sole proprietorship owned by both parents, kind of as Ryan mentioned before, one of the parents, then they do not need to pay the self-employment tax. But once you kind of get an S corp involved, that self-employment tax will kind of come into play. And also the streamline, the correct, technically correct way to do this is to have them file a W-4 and I-9. And then of course, file a W-2 and put them on legitimate payroll and go through all that. However, there are streamlined versions and we could talk about this if you're a private client of ours or a tax smart insider would give you more details. But essentially because they're not paying the self-employment tax or really paying any taxes, uh, you could just file just a regular W-2 for them and not have to go through a lot of the other steps that you would have to go through with a legitimate employee. But again, uh, if you're going to be doing that, you want to make sure you speak to your tax advisor. And of course, if you're a client of ours or a member of our of our community, we'd be happy to help you kind of navigate those waters. But just something to keep in mind, this is a real deduction and it can be powerful in many ways, but you have to make sure you do things right. Hey, are you tired of working with generalist CPAs that tell you you can't use the real estate professional status, the short-term rental loophole, or cost segregation studies, or worse, have no idea what these things are? If so, it's time to elevate your game and work with a CPA firm that gets it. Here at Whole CPA, we've worked with thousands of investors, helping them save millions of dollars in taxes through proactive tax strategy and planning, tax preparation, and outsourced accounting solutions. So if you're ready to elevate your game, make tax filing painless, and save thousands of dollars in taxes, what are you waiting for? Just head on over to www.therealestatecpa.com slash podcast to request an initial consultation today. We are accepting clients for the 2023 and 2024 tax year so if you're looking to make a change, you have nothing to lose. Again, you can request an initial consultation by visiting www.therealestatecpa.com slash podcast. We look forward to hearing from you and learning more about your situation and how we can help. But for now, we'll dive right back into today's episode. Now let's break down some of the, the tax benefits or tax advantages for the parents. Ryan, again, this is one of your favorite strategies. You want to take this one? Yeah. So essentially it's, it's three benefits and I'll just kind of break them down one by one, make a comment on each of them. So number one is your business right? Owned by the parents exclusively, 100%, hoping that it is a LLC, not an S corp to make it the most efficient. It gets a deduction. Okay. So just like you would pay a contractor to do work for you, just like you'd pay an employee to do work for you, that wage is a deduction. That's an expense on your P&L. So it's either reducing profit or furthering a loss. That's great, right? That's just more deductions that we can get. Fantastic. Now you're paying less tax as the parents. Okay. That's deduction. Number one. Benefit two, is that then that deduction for you for the business is then going to the child tax-free, right? Assuming we follow these steps, not an S-corp, pay less than the standard deduction, under age 18, right? Things like that. That's going to them at a 0% tax rate. So let's say you're a parent listening to this and you're in the 32% bracket. Okay. Now you've reduced your taxes by 32% on that profit, right? Equal to the deduction amount going to the kids tax-free at 0%. The really cool thing, even if we just stop, we got one more step, but even if we just stop, you as a household have now just created generational wealth and the money hasn't left the house. It's now gone from you to your child and they're a child, so they're living with you, right? And so like it hasn't left the home, the money has just transferred to the child and now we've created more wealth in the form of tax savings. The family hasn't paid as much in taxes and now that's kind of gone to the kids effectively. So again, second benefit, tax-free to the children. Amazing. Now, third is that we want to move those dollars that the kids earn into a Roth IRA, okay? So a lot of people will be like, okay, is it an IRA or is it a Roth IRA? It's a Roth, okay? Just to kind of say it plainly. So the Roth IRA limits as of 2024, you can contribute up to $7,000 for the kids, okay? Now, the question I get here sometimes is, why don't I just gift my kids $7,000 every year to put into their Roth. The answer is because you can't do that because it's a gift and it's not earned income. So the key thing here that's really unique in our strategy is that these kids are earning wages, right? As soon as nine, <laughs> and now that's going into a Roth IRA, right? So now that money, we've paid the tax upfront for the kid that's 0%, okay? 
Okay. For all the rest of us, that's 20 something, 30 something percent that we're paying. If we're getting money in there, the kids are at 0%. And now depending on how they take it out, when all those things, it could come out at 0% as well. So all of that growth over time, starting at nine could be 0% too. So those are the three benefits. And I just want to say one more time, Tom here, like one other comment with the Roth versus the standard deduction thing. Because now people have heard us say, okay, 14,600 standard deduction, but $7,000 Roth, what am I shooting for, right? To me, as a parent, I'm only shooting for the Roth, to be honest. Like that's the amount I'm shooting for. And just for some of you out there listening, do your own math, <laughs> do $7,000 divided by, you know, 10 bucks an hour, right? That is 700 hours that you need to now get from your child to make that work. Tell me, where are you going to get 700 hours from your child in a year <laughs> to do that, right? It's just kind of unrealistic for most people to even try to pursue that standard deduction number for what we're talking about, okay? If you've got a super ambitious high school student who's like, I'm really smart, I just do my classes and then I go work, you know, 10 hours a week for my parents' job or company, great. That's a different solution. For a lot of you listening, you've got really small business and it's already part-time for you. Where are you going to get 700 hours again? I'm assuming, you know, 10 bucks an hour sort of thing here where you're going to have your kid do that. So the point is 14,600 should not necessarily be the goal. You can get all of it tax-free for sure. Me as a parent, I just want to move as much as I can into that Roth. And for right now, it's $7,000 for the year. Yeah, no, absolutely. Super powerful strategy. And Ross, well, I'll talk a little bit about like the power of a Roth. But before I do that, a question I got a lot was, do I need to put it in the Roth, right? Do you need to put the money in the Roth IRA? You do not need to, right? You could take the money, you could move into your child's bank account. And yeah, I'm sure you could have a custodian account. There's no issue with that. And you could let your kids spend the money if you want, right? Maybe you pay them a little bit more than 7,000, right? Just, you know, not, not, not the full amount, but maybe a little bit more, give them some spending cash. But the real power of the Roth is that there's a few things with a Roth IRA. First thing is when you put the money in, right? it can grow tax-free throughout their lifetime, right? And if you start at nine years old, you're giving them, let's say, maybe a nine-year leg or almost, you know, rough, almost 10 years of additional compounding. Let's just say you put it in the S&P 500. And if you go and just take out a compound interest calculator, you could see how powerful that head start is for them. But there's more benefits to a Roth than just that. They could take out the contributions at any time. So the money that goes in, that $7,000, for example, and that is indexed for inflation, by the way. So that will increase as the years go on, or it should increase at least as the years go on. So they could take that contribution out tax-free and don't have to pay taxes on the contribution. Now, if they take their earnings out, they usually have to pay some income on the earnings. However, there's some exceptions to that too. Uh, the first one is uh, they could pay, they could take up to $10,000 out of the earnings to pay for their first primary residence, right? You're saving for their future no matter which way you look at it, right? And they can go ahead and take that money and have a head start for their first down payment. Now, the other thing that you could do too is if they take money out for qualified education expenses such as college, that money is not subject to penalties upon withdrawal, right? So uh, they still pay income tax on that, but it's not subject to the normal Roth IRA penalties for early withdrawals. So it's just another way to stash money away for their future is flexible. Now think about it, the way I always look at this is this. So I, I don't have kids today, but I don't know what's gonna happen when I have kids, like you know, right now, the way the economy is, I feel like college is not always necessary for every profession or every field, right? You don't always need to go to college. So who knows what's going to happen in 18 years or 10 years from now with your kid. So the way I look at this is if they get to 18, they have the option to take out some of those contributions tax-free. Maybe they want to start a business. Maybe they want to go join a mentorship program that's not necessarily qualified education or tuition as it would be in the traditional sense. So this gives you a lot of flexibility to save for their future, whether it's for retirement, for their first primary residence, or perhaps future educational or to fund a business in the future. So it's a lot of flexibility with that Roth IRA. Yeah. And the thing I like to talk about too, that I hear from other parents as I'm going through this is like, well, I'm using a 529. And that that's then another part of the conversation that usually comes up. And, uh, 529s can be great. And just as a reminder, it can only be a state deduction. This is not a federal deduction and it really depends on the state. So sure, you're getting some of that more tax efficient. It's not like a federal thing. It's like maybe your state thing, maybe, okay? Not all states allow you to get a deduction depending on where you are. But the nuance there, yes, it can grow tax-free and whatnot. 
depending on how it's used, but you have to use it for qualified education. <laughs> then I know they have been changing, you know, 529 rules and things like that to be converted to a Roth and, and all that. We're not going to get into that today. But the point is the flexibility with the Roth IRA is more there based on what you just said, Tom. And I agree the 529 has a little bit more restrictions on it because it only can be used on that qualified education, tuition, stuff like that. So I totally agree. There's just more flexibility because imagine like, say, Bill Gates or Steve Jobs' parents, they're dumping tens of thousands of dollars into this 529 plan, you know, back then. They're like, oh my gosh, so like you're set. You got college paid for all four years. And he's like, peace out. I'm going to go start Microsoft or I'm going to go start Apple. What do they do with that, you know, 529? I'm just not as clear. And maybe some financial advisors listening are like, oh, you can just do this and that. But at the end of the day, what if that was all just in a Roth? Then they would have been able to just literally do withdraw and go do their thing, right? Invest in, in their company or whatever, right? So there's just more flexibility there in what they can be doing. So I just like to add that in there too. That's always part of the conversation. Yeah, no, absolutely. A lot of people do compare the strategy we're talking about here with 529s. So for anybody who's not listening, anybody who's not aware, 529s is a, uh, is a savings vehicle to save for your children's education. And it can be used for certain K through 12 expenses as well. But, you know, to your point, Ryan, it, who knows what's going to happen in the future? So the Roth does give a lot more flexibility. And just my personal opinion on this, again, I don't have kids today, but I have thought through this because I am a financial planner, right? I do have that CFP is that when I have a kid, what I'm probably do is going to fund one 529 account. And I'll mention why I would do that. And then each of my kids would have the Roth. Now that's because the 529 can be transferred between siblings. So say, for example, you have three kids. I'm just pulling a number out of a hat here. Uh, two of your kids decide not to go to college. All right. Now that 529 can be transferred to the child who will go to college. And then they all have these Roth IRAs that they could use to do what they want and have that flexibility. So that's just my personal opinion on it. Not saying everybody has to do that at all by any stretch. That's just kind of what's been percolating in my head about like, you know, okay, when I have kids, what am I going to do? Right. And that's just something that comes to mind because again, I do believe that college is not necessary for everything, especially these days, just with the advancements in technology. But there's definitely certain professions like law, accounting, medical professions, where college is necessary and perhaps the most appropriate form of education for those specific professions. So that's just kind of the way I look at it. But again, the point we're just trying to make here is the Roth gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility. And we all know the sooner you can start investing uh, on behalf of your children, the more compounding it has. And you know, in the worst case, if they don't use it for anything, they're just going to have a massive head start in retirement. And we have to remember too, when they take the money out at retirement at 59 and a half, which is the current age, who knows that might change. They're not paying taxes on it, right? They're not paying taxes on it today. And that's because presumably they pay taxes on it when they got paid the money. But again, in this strategy, because they're under 18, they're not subject to those taxes. So it's phenomenal all around. Yeah. And I want to add two things there that I just wanted to mention. So one, I don't know if we specifically mentioned this early on. And for those of you listening, I apologize. The FLSA age rule, right? We keep talking about nine years old to implement this. The FLSA basically set the mark at 14 years old, okay? So with this kind of now, kids could start as early as nine, just kind of what we've seen. That's kind of what we think is probably the minimum. You're getting them a five-year head start instead of like, oh, they're at 14 and now they go get their first job at Chick-fil-A or Target or Walmart, or whatever, right? So now you've given them a five-year head start in contributing into their Roth IRA, right? Compounding effect, if you do the math over 60 years, 50 years of investing, those additional five years can be massive. <laughs> right. So point is, is like the five years earlier has a big impact. That's, that's number one. Number two is that the flow of money here, I just wanted to mention, uh, because a common thing I've seen is people say, oh, I'll just contribute the deduction out of my business account and move it directly into the Roth IRA for the kids. And that to me is a little bit of a misstep. I think you might be okay as long as you've got that W-2. But just to talk about kind of the proper flow of money for 20 seconds here, you do want to have it move from your business checking account to the child's checking account and then from the child's checking account into the Roth IRA. Just wanted to like put that in there as like kind of a proper flow uh, to kind of show the paper trail as kind of like what's going on, right? Just like you pay an employee, it goes to their bank account, their checking account, whatever, then they have to contribute that into their own account because they're probably under 18. They're your kid, right? You're going to have to help them and make sure that they get that right. But at the end of the day, I just kind of want to talk about that one little flow of money. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just like all the other strategies out there, documentation is key. Doing things properly is key because 
this is an area that sometimes I think if you pay them the minimum wage, you have a job description, they're doing legitimate work in the business, you'll be fine. But some people abuse this stuff. So you don't want to abuse it. You want to do things the right way. And uh, that's just is part of the game here. So I think we covered a lot about this strategy. I think we covered basically how it works, what it is, why you'd want to use it. Is there anything you think we missed here that we should be covering that we have not? Uh, one thing just to add and make sure we've talked about it is the kind of proper roles of your kids. So one thing that would be like the, the bad or the ugly here would be trying to make your child the CEO or CFO or COO of your business. No. Okay. No one else is going to do that uh, to hire your kids. So just a, you know, reasonable person who's not, you know, you as the parent who's maybe is like, oh yeah, my kid's great and amazing. No one else is going to hire your 14 year old, nine year old, you know, whatever to be the CEO of their business. Not realistic. So just be careful of kind of one titles because we talked about, we want to have a job description. So just be careful there. Don't, don't go crazy. And it might just be something administrative that they do. Uh, an assistant, uh, an office assistant, an office administrator, something like that, where we're not talking about, again, CEO, CFO. So just make sure it's reasonable. You're going to put this on paper, on a document, do something that makes sense. That's that's the last thing. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're interested, if you want help with something like this, we could certainly help you as uh, we help many clients here at the firm with this. So if, if you're looking for a new CPA or just want to see what you might be missing, we, we'd love to learn more about your situation and how we can help. You can visit www.therealestatecpa.com slash podcast and go ahead and complete that brief form and we'll contact you with next steps. And also, as always, we are always looking for talented CPAs and EAs, people with real estate tax and accounting experience, email us at onboarding at hallcpallc.com with your resume, a little information about you, why you'd want to work for our firm, why you think you'd be a good fit. And uh, who knows, we might just be talking to you next. You might be on a podcast with us at some point in time. So that's about it for today. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. And before we go, next week, we're going to have a very exciting episode. Next week, we are bringing on Justin Shore, and we're going to be talking about hypotheticals and specifically, what happens if certain deductions and certain income thresholds that have not been indexed for inflation for many, many years, sometimes decades, what happens if they were? And I think it's going to be an exciting episode. People are going to love it. It's, it's theoretical, but it is something very interesting. So we'll be back for that next week. Again, we'll catch you then, but that's it for today. <laughs>